Hi, well, welcome to lesson one. We're looking at Jeremy Duff's Elements of New Testament Greek. I'm in chapter one, uh, section 1.1, 1 .1, and I'm looking at page 12. And there you've got a table which includes this, which is the Greek alphabet and the corresponding letters in the uh, English alphabet, uh, the Roman alphabet, really. Um, now, what I want to talk about today is just some brief notes about how to write the letters, how to what the letters are, and how to transliterate them. Transliterate means to write these letters in their corresponding letters in the English alphabet that you're familiar with. And you'll find that all over the place in commentaries and books and articles and so on. And it's important to be able to do this so both so that you understand what the letters are and then you can read um, what those uh, books and commentaries say. So, um, most of the uh, letters are fairly self-explanatory, fairly easy. Duff recommends that you learn to write in the way that your teacher writes, or at least you start like that. So if you've got a real flesh and blood teacher, then copy him or her. If you're stuck with me, then sorry about that, but here's how I do it, at least when I'm doing it neatly. And like all of us, when you're in the flow, when you've got used to it, you'll write it um, less precisely, and that's fine, because you can still recognise and understand it, and that's the important thing. Now, as we're going through, let me just highlight a few things which Duff either mentions or, but not in so much detail, or which are sometimes cause confusion. First, there are not five, but seven vowels in the Greek alphabet. There's a normal five, um, alpha, like the English A, epsilon, like the English E, uh, iota, like the English um, uh, I, omicron, like the English O, and upsilon, like the English U. A few notes about these. Do not write the upsilon like that. That's wrong. It's like that. Mistake. Okay. Also, while we're on the subject of the upsilon, note, distinguish that, please, with the round bottom from the new, which has a sharp point at the base. Um, oh, goodness, I can't write today. There we are. Um, distinguish those two. Rounded, sharp point at the base. They're very different letters. But there are two other vowels as well. There's a long E, which we call an eta, and a long O, which we call omega. A couple of notes about these. Omega, not omega. Omicron, not omicron. Notice, get the pronunciation of the letter, O, in the name of the letter. So, O, omicron, like that. O, omega, like that. Even if you're American and you're used to saying omega, Try to say omega, because it will discipline you to distinguish these two letters from each other. Uh, this one, eta, I prefer to pronounce it air and not a, as uh, Duff does. Duff suggests it, pronouncing it like the long e in, o in obey. If you do that, you'll get confused later on when we look at the pronunciation of some other um, letter combinations in Greek. If you pronounce it air, you'll be able to distinguish it, and this is quite common now. It's perfectly standard, so I suggest pronouncing this like air, as in the air around us, or the noise that sheep make. Bear, like that. Okay. Um, a few other bits and pieces. Don't put an I on top of an iota. It doesn't have an I. It's just the down stroke. A few others. There are a whole group of um, Greek letters that are transliterated into English as more than one English letter. For example, the Greek letter theta becomes the English TH. The Greek letter phi becomes the English PH. Not really the F, that's, that's not standard really, as far as I can make out. Um, it sounds like a F, but don't write it in English as a F, write it as a PH. The Greek chi, like CH, as in Christ, Christos, and the Greek psi, like the English PS. Psi, like lips. One letter that you can transliterate as two if you want, but I've never really seen it done, is the rho. You could do it like that, but that seems to be um, non-standard nowadays. Better, I think, just to transliterate the rho as an R. Uh, Duff says you should pronounce it with a kind of R sound, like rabbi. Maybe you should, that's fine. But I don't think you're in danger of failing to distinguish this from any other letter if you don't do that. So a R is fine. Rabbi is okay, just as Rabbi is okay. Um, one or two other uh, notes. I think that's everything on the alphabet. A um, few other things. Uh, yeah, the sigma. You notice there are two sigmas. Oh my goodness, what a pain. Well, it's just because this one, the final form S, 
the final form, sigma, sorry, is the form that goes at the end of a word. If you have a word that ends in a s sound, a sigma, then that's the letter you use. If the sigma is anywhere else in the word, it's that one. It sounds a bit strange and it sounds a bit pointless, but you very quickly get used to it um, and it's not a problem. You actually have the same thing in some other ancient languages, like in Hebrew as well. It's a final form, nun, for the letter n in Hebrew. Um, what else is there? Um, oh yes, um, uh, many people manage to write the theta in one stroke without taking the pen off the page, just as they do the other letters, um, or most of the other letters. Um, for example, the beta, uh, beta, like that, or the delta, like that. I've never managed to write the theta consistently in one stroke, and I don't think it, ter it matters terribly much, because to be honest, you're writing for yourself, not for somebody else. If you want to write it in one stroke, I guess you can, and, and you can see how Duff has done that. Um, but that's pretty much it. Oh yeah, one other note. Um, uh, uh, Duff points out that the gamma, if you have one gamma, it transliterates as a G, but if you have two gammas, it transliterates as NG. Oh, what a pain. Well, really, this is, is this one of uh, uh, a collection of little quirks, and again, we'll come across this later, and by the time you get to it, it won't phase you at all. Don't be phased by it now, but just th um, uh, do be aware of it. We don't pronounce this gaga, and we don't transliterate it gaga. We pronounce and transliterate it ng. And Duff gives the example of the English word angel, which comes from the Greek word angelos, like that. Well, there we are, that's the first Greek word to, to learn. And if you learn that, then you've also learned at the same time this little rule, which is one of a group of four um, letter combinations, which we'll come across later, which we pronounce and transliterate ng, not giga. Okay, just looking at Duff, I think that's it. Remember, 20 minutes a day is better than three hours once a week. Keep cracking on, keep learning these, do the exercises, learn to write the alphabet, Learn to say the letters of the alphabet. I'll go through them at the end of the video, and then we'll see you next time. Okay, here goes with the letters of the alphabet. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, iota, kappa, lambda, mu, nu, xi, omicron, pi, rho, sigma, sigma again, tau, epsilon, phi, chi, psi, omega. One last thing, just remembered. This letter, we transliterate as a Z, but if it comes at the beginning of the word, we pronounce it Z as well. However, if it comes in the middle of a word, for some reason, it seems more common to pronounce it DZ, like euangelizomai. Euangelizomai means I preach the gospel. But we only ever transliterate it as a Z. For now, don't worry. Again, once we get into the habit of reading and speaking and writing, all this will become crystal clear. And we'll see you next time when we're going to be looking at a few more bits and pieces about pronunciation, a few more letter combinations, breathings, and we'll move on from there. See you next time.